What's up everyone? Great to see you all. I mean, I can't literally see you, but you know what I mean. Today we're going to be talking all things money and tennis, exactly how much Federer and Osaka make, how much I make personally, and exactly how tennis players make a living from paid appearances, endorsements, prize money and sponsorships. Let's get straight into it. Last week, as many of you would have seen, Forbes released their list for the highest earning athletes of the year. And it wasn't Messi, Ronaldo, Tiger Woods or LeBron James who came out on top. It was Roger Federer with a whopping $106.3 million earned in just a year. And not only did we have a tennis player as the highest earning male athlete on earth, Naomi Osaka also topped the highest earning female athlete on earth with $37.4 million earned in the last year. So clearly, the sport of tennis can be unbelievably lucrative at the top of the game, beating huge global sports such as football, basketball and golf. But how can this be? Tennis is not bigger than, say, football. So why are tennis players topping the highest earners lists? In one word, endorsements. Before I show you how much money they're raking in with endorsements, I'd really appreciate it if you could just like this video below. It would really help me get this video shared around as much as possible. Anyway, back to why you're watching this video. In the last year, Federer's prize money has totaled $6.3 million, and his endorsements have totaled $100 million. Osaka was a very similar story, with $3.4 million in prize money, and $34 million in endorsements, according to Forbes. Compare this to number two on the highest paid athletes list, which was Ronaldo. He earns a salary of 65 million a year, but his endorsements only total 40 million a year. I mean, I say only, I mean, you know, I'd take 40 quid, let alone 40 mil, but you get what I'm saying. The comparison is so much different. Tennis players earn a lot less in terms of prize money, but their endorsements are so much higher. Why are the endorsements so high in tennis, even though it's not the most viewed sport in the world or the biggest televised sport in the world? It's a combination between the schedule and the demographics. So first of all, the schedule is 11 months out of the year with the potential of playing five matches each week in a tournament week. That gives tennis players huge exposure compared to other sports. Then comes the demographics of the average tennis fan. Tennis in general is an elitist sport. Quoting Forbes magazine, the demographics of the tennis fan make sponsoring top players attractive for brands. At the US Open last year, attendance skewed in favor of women by a ratio of 56 to 44, a rarity at big time sporting events. 78% held at least a bachelor's degree versus 35% for the US overall. The average household income was $216,000. This is a group with significant disposable income, ready to buy apparel, sporting equipment, cars, watches, and financial services. So really, all the money in tennis comes through endorsements, which is the problem. Because who wants to endorse a player who's, say, 200 in the world? Or how about a player like me who's 450 in the world? I mean, besides my mum, dad, maybe a few of my aunties and uncles, no one. And the reality is, not only do companies not want to endorse players that aren't playing ATP Tour matches week in, week out, but the prize money is actually exponential in tennis too. If there was a graph to show what prize money in tennis was like, this would be the one that most accurately describes it. Basically, the prize money is pretty terrible in futures, fairly poor in challenges, and then it exponentially rises once you get to the ATP Tour, especially when you get to the latter rounds, which is why it's estimated that you have to be around 200 to 250 in the world as a male tennis player to break even, and probably even higher as a female tennis player. To prove this point, I did a bit of research, and I looked at who was ranked 200th in the world at the end of 2019 year. On the ATP rankings, it was a Spanish player called Morales. In 2019 as a whole, he earned $54,600, and that's on the ATP website, so that's before tax. Now, given that the average tournament roughly taxes about 20% on average, if you take that off the original figure, now the figure's down to 43,680, which many of you may be thinking, wow, that's a great salary, I'd love to be earning that. But you also don't have the same expenses as this dude. He probably spent $40,000 of that on travel, employing his team, and all the other expenses that tennis players have. Tennis players don't have the luxury of cheap living and an employer playing all their business expenses. Everything comes out of a tennis player's own pocket. I downloaded an app in 2019 to keep track of all my expenses and income for the year. 
In the last year, I spent £34,528 on all my expenses. Now, that's me pretty much investing in myself to the fully, doing everything as professional as I can. That's not to say that I was travelling with a coach, a physio, a trainer each week. That's just my own personal costs, plus a few weeks here and there of having a coach with me. For sure, I could have spent less, but that would have meant cutting corners and not doing things as professionally as I would have wanted. My income for the 2019-2020 financial year was £40,000. The only reason I was able to get a figure that high is because I got the opportunity to play at Wimbledon this year, both in the men's singles qualifying, men's main draw doubles, and the mixed doubles where I actually had a really good run and made the mixed doubles quarterfinals with even silver. Had I not had that opportunity and done so well in the mixed doubles, my income would have been half the amount that it actually was. So I'm actually very fortunate, as are the rest of the players who come from nations with home grand slams. So in reality, as someone who got a career high of 319 last year, my prize money would have been in the region of 15 to 20,000 pounds, which sucks when you consider I spent 35,000 pounds on expenses for the year. I mean, obviously I wouldn't have been able to spend that much if I hadn't earned the 40,000 pounds, but still, you know, if you think about it in reality, if I want to do things as professionally as I can, had I spent that 35k and only earned 15 to 20k, I would have been in a 15 to 20k debt. And that's just from one year. In terms of my sponsorships, I have clothes and racket sponsorships by Adidas and Yonex. Saves me a lot of money not having to buy equipment and clothes, but I don't get paid anything. I'm on a take it and wear it with pride kind of contract, whereas Feder is on a here's 30 mil and you can design your own clothes kind of contract. Now you may be thinking, Evan, you're not really selling tennis to me. So here comes the positive part. Although it can be tough to make a living as a tennis player, I do think we need to try and let go of the financial stress and see tennis for what it really is. A fun sport that provides us with so many opportunities that normal people don't get. Because at the end of the day, we live to our means, and whatever we earn in tennis generally goes straight back into funding our tennis. And whether we're earning 100k a year or nothing, we can all enjoy playing tennis each and every day and pursuing this sport. For years I had to budget, pick my tournaments based on what I could afford, and limit myself in terms of how much I could actually invest in my tennis. And I still have these financial stresses. I think the message here is that we've got to focus on the process and enjoy playing this sport and investing what we do have into the sport. And gradually as we get better, one day we might find ourselves in the position where we're picking up endorsements left, right and centre. Aston Martin, if you're watching this. If you enjoyed this video, please like, comment and subscribe below. I'd really appreciate it. And stay tuned for the next video. Peace. Thank you.